Good morning. How many besides me is glad that what's falling down outside isn't snow yet? Yeah? <laughs> we all know what could happen. We're in a series um, about vision and values, and today we're actually concluding this. We've been talking about our goal is to create a space that is safe for people to find authentic faith in Christ. Uh, we want to create a space where people can find real friends. Not just someone that you follow on social media, but that you actually do life with. We want to create a space where, where we can find our future, the, the purpose, the meaning, the reasons that we're here. And then there's some guiding principles that we live by. And so we, we want to be a place that's hospitable because God loves everyone. We think everyone ought to be welcome. How many think that's still a good idea? Yeah. In a world where more and more doors get closed, how many think it's important we keep ours open? Amen. And then we also want to be a place of excellence, which is about just trying to do better. Not about perfection. It's about trying to, to improve how we serve. And then spiritual sensitivity. How can we know what to say and what to pray? And today I want to talk about generosity. And uh, some people are a little anxious about that topic. And, and here's what I want you to know. And that is that contrary to what you hear almost constantly in every form of media available today, there is not a shortage of financial and material resources in our world. Even in its fallen state, this world is an amazingly abundant place. What we have a shortage of is generosity. We do not have a shortage of resources. And uh, so we start thinking about this topic and we start wondering, like, maybe you've never played this game, but I have. What, what if you suddenly came into a lot of money? Not just a little bit of more money, but a lot more money. How would that change your life? Like, would you still live in the same house or would you relocate? Would you still live in the same state <laughs> or would you relocate? Uh, would you still wear the same clothes or would you upgrade your style a little bit? Uh, would you still drive the same car? And chances are we would do a lot of upgrades. How about giving? Would you upgrade your giving too? It's a thing that we don't often think about, but it's really important. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at how generosity impacts our lives when we exercise it and the world around us. And the first thing I want you to see is that money has a powerful influence on how we view ourselves and our world. Money has a powerful influence on how we view ourselves and our world. Uh, when we have some money, we often think like this, I earned this. I, I, I did this. And it's true, like you showed up for work, but somebody gave you that opportunity for that job, and someone gave you the capacity to do that job, and someone gave you a track that allowed you to get the education to do that job, and all of those things were gifts that got you to that place. And by the way, all of those gifts came from God our Father, because the book of James tells us that all good and perfect gifts come from Him. But we can think if someone has more than us, they must have cheated the system. We think less of them because they have more than us. Sometimes uh, we think if I had more money, I would get more noticed. I would have more friends. It's kind of a shortcut in relationship to, to in relationships. And also, if you have more money, you might need other people less. You know, if, if I, I wouldn't have to be as nice to some people. Yeah, people think like that. Uh, Jesus knows how much power resources can have in our lives. It's why he talks about it as frequently as he does. And I'd like to look at a passage this morning where Paul addresses this, the Apostle Paul, in 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. And he says, This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, Others will, be, 
Others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. It's a powerful passage of scripture. God uses generosity to accomplish multiple things. And this passage outlined, the first thing is that it meets others' needs. That, that was the phrase, supplying the needs of the Lord's people. There was a famine in Jerusalem, and many of the Gentile churches had become aware of it, and, and the Apostle Paul was actually responsible for taking up an offering in all of these churches so that people would be able to survive back in Jerusalem. God uses generosity because it reveals his heart. That's what it says, overflowing in many expression of thanks to God. People started thanking God because they could see the heart of God through the gifts of God's people. It also gives evidence of our faith. That's the phrase he used, right? Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves. There's, there's evidence to your faith. And it builds community. The phrase there was, and in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you. Hearts are brought together when people are generous with each other. So how are we able to be generous people? And the first thing has to do with some level of provision. You have to have something to give in order to give it, right? And the primary way that God provides for us is actually work. He gives us something to do. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says this, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do something useful for which you are compensated so that you will not only meet your own needs, but have something to share with others. I think a lot of us have a fantasy where, where we could have as much money as we need without having to do any work. And there's something very powerful about doing something that's useful. And not just for ourselves, but to be able to share with someone else. So the primary way that God provides for us is not an angel showing up at our door with a box full of money or by killing off a rich relative so that we get a lot of money from them. Like that's not how God provides for us. Uh, God provides for us by giving us opportunities to work. But the primary enemy of generosity is actually debt. There's a lot of things we'd like to do, but we're unable to do because we have this mountain of debt that we have to pay off. Romans 13 says this, let no debt remain among you except continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. In in some ways, debt is unavoidable in our culture, the way it's designed. So uh, often you have to go in some measure of debt for a home, but a home can be an appreciating asset. Uh, the, the cost of cars these days, it's often uh, common that you have to go in debt for a car because transportation is so essential for the work that we do and the responsibilities that we carry. Um, the challenge is, is that what we actually find is you can actually go in debt on anything. You can go in debt on a, on a phone. You can go in debt on a TV. You can go in debt for furniture in your house. You can, you can go in debt for almost anything. And the way we think about debt is not what will this cost me in the long run. We think about what's the minimum monthly payment. And the result is, is that we can get under a mountain of debt. Now, there are times when our heart is moved, it's kind of prompted to do something generous for someone, but if we're unable to do that because of all the indebtedness that we have, that actually creates an internal conflict. To have a sense where you, you're prompted to generosity, but because of your financial realities, you're unable to respond. Scripture calls us to solve this problem by, by listen to this, by living beneath your means. If you need every dime to keep your head above water, then you're really going to struggle with opportunities to be generous with anyone. 
And there'll be a constant ongoing anxiety, a worry. There's something about uh, financial indebtedness that just causes us to be anxious. We're, we're worried we're gonna be able to keep making the payments. We're worried if something we're in debt for stops working, how are we gonna get another one of those? We have to learn to live beneath our means, which means we make a decision. I won't consume everything that comes through my hands. I will contribute some of what comes through my hands. That God calls us to do both. We are to consume, but we are also to contribute. The best way to go about this is to actually budget generosity. You, you have to budget for utilities. You have to budget for food. If you go on vacations, you budget for vacations. Why not budget for generosity? Because it's so painful to have that impulse to do something and not have the means by which to do it. So the primary way that God provides for us is work. The primary enemy of our generosity is actually debt. The primary way we experience growth and change in our lives is being generous with our time, with our capabilities, and with our resources. Getting more is not the same as growing more. You can live quite a shallow life with a lot of stuff. You can have a lot of material things and your heart can be hard and your mind can be narrow. Generosity has a way of expanding, softening our heart and expanding our capacity in how we see the world. Now the Christian teaching on generosity is actually empowering because we're constantly told today that you are not enough. You can't make a difference. And what the teaching on generosity in, in Christianity says is everyone can contribute something and every single one of those gifts is used by God to make a difference in someone else's life. You can make a difference. It's a huge way to think about our time in our world. You don't have to be the wealthiest person. You don't have to be the most influential person to make a difference. You can be a generous person and that is what makes a difference. So how can you tell if someone's a Christian? That is a good question. And most of us uh, will think about a set of rules or uh, maybe the capacity to know about certain songs or showing up in places like this on a Sunday. Um, I've, my, my beverage of choice, if I'm not drinking water, I'll, I'll have a diet, whatever. I actually like the diet better. Don't judge me for that. It's just true. And uh, I've, I've never had a person in a restaurant come up to me and, and say, um, I noticed that you are, are drinking a diet beverage. What must I do to be saved? <laughs> it's, it's like no, nobody thinks like that. No, nobody does that. Um, so how can people tell? How, how can we know that this isn't just a set of rituals we go through and a set of rules that we keep, but something's actually happening inside of us that lasts not just momentarily, but forever. Uh, in the early church, the world actually, or in the, in the ancient church, the world noticed some things that were different about the church and about people who were Christians. And one of the things that they noticed is that they were relationally generous. They were relationally generous. They would invite anybody to the table to eat with them. I, I want you to think about this. They, they had a table of fellowship, and their commitment to Jesus was actually greater than their commitment to their, their loyalty to patriotic things, their commitment to their ethnicity, their commitment to their, their town. Like in, in the ancient world, in the ancient church, Buffalo Bills fans and New England Patriot fans could sit at the same table and have something else to talk about. But that's too easy, so I'll go right where some of you live. In the ancient world, if we lived like that, people who were conservative and Republicans could sit at the same table with people who are liberal and Democrats and share a meal together and have something to talk about besides politics. Imagine. Why? Because there was a greater loyalty to the one who gave their life for them 
than the people they lived with or the city they lived in or their own political ideologies or their own ethnicity or their own education. There was something greater than all of that. And in case you're confused about this, Jesus demands first loyalty. Because whenever we make something else our first loyalty, it becomes a source of division. And when Jesus is primary, everybody gets brought to the table. In fact, that's, that includes ethnicities. You have to realize up until Christianity, a person's religion was always determined by their ethnicity. Romans worshiped Roman gods. Greeks worshiped Greek gods. Jewish people worship the Jewish God. You always knew a person's religion as soon as you knew their ethnicity. But in a city called Antioch, there was an expansion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In that city, there were lots of different ethnic communities. They actually lived within walled areas inside a walled city. It's a really interesting thing. But they came out from behind their walls and they celebrated their faith together. And for the first time in history, you couldn't identify a person's religion by a identifying their ethnicity. So that's when they started calling them Christians because they couldn't figure out any other thing to call them. They weren't, their primary loyalty was not their ethnicity. Their primary loyalty was Jesus. That's a radical generosity, a radical generosity. They were also generous. The, the, the early Christians were known for their generous commitment uh, uh, sexually. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Some people believe that they're being generous to share themselves with a lot of other people. Uh, that's not really generosity. That's an inflated view of self. Christians lived in a culture where it was common to have more than one wife. It was common to access prostitutes. It was common, the wealthier you were and the more influential you were, the more options you had to live out your sexual fantasies. And Christians decided to do something else. Christians were generous in their sexual commitment because they gave all of themselves to one person. They only shared their bed with one person. They shared the table with anyone. They shared the bed with one person. To give all of you to one person is a radically generous thing to do. And they were generous in hostile circumstances. Christians were largely ridiculed. They were mistreated. They were persecuted, they were marginalized, and their response to this mistreatment was always to show respect to the person who was responsible for the mistreatment. Always. They were generous with their respect. They believed that even if we don't agree, you were still created in the image and likeness of God. And on that basis alone, you have dignity and you are worthy of respect. And I choose to respect you even when you are not respecting me. That is radical generosity. And they were generous with their resources. Christians were quick to share. In fact, there's a story about this in the life of Jesus. He's going through a town, and there's a person who's up in a tree just kind of watching the parade. The reason he's in the tree is a person of short stature. He's not a tall guy. He is a person who has quite a bit, he's amassed quite a bit of personal wealth. And that is by reason of the job that he has. He collects taxes from those in Israel in order to pass it on to Rome. And back in those days, you were allowed to keep a portion of the taxes that you collected. And so he had done quite well for himself. This is what it says in Luke, the, the 19th chapter. Jesus goes to his house, and this is how the conversation picks up. Zacchaeus stood up and said to Jesus, Look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus is not saying he paid enough to get into the kingdom. Jesus is saying his heart has been transformed to see how much I can hold, how much I can hide, how much I can hoard to someone who says, I will give and I will give radically and I will give generously as much as I possibly can. And Jesus said that kind of heart transformation only happens when grace of God has come in and penetrated the hardness of our own heart. That's how it works. He didn't buy his way in. The grace of Jesus transformed him.
Scripture seems to indicate that there's a percentage of giving that begins to liberate our hearts. In Scripture, what it says is, when we are able to give away 10% of what we earn, that something begins to change in our heart. This is called the tithe. Jesus actually spoke about this too. In Matthew, the 23rd chapter, he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees and hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices. Sounds like it's bad. And they, like when they would have a little spice plant on their windowsill, they would take a tenth of that and give it to the Lord. They were very detailed. A tenth of your spices, mint, dill, cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. The Pharisees saw their gifts as an exemption from having to do other things. I gave at the office. And, and Jesus says, that's not how it works. When we're willing to let go of our resources in a healthy way, it actually enables us to do even more challenging things. It has to do with justice has to do with faithfulness, has to do with mercy. Giving away 10% sounds impossible. And there are lots of people who think that it is, even though there are many people who practice this discipline in their lives. The truth is, is if your income was reduced by 10%, you'd find a way to make it work. Now, it's possible that your pattern of money management in your own life has boxed you in in a way where you don't have those options. You don't have any margin. And what I would recommend for you is that you begin to, to put your financial house in order so that you do have something that you can share with someone else. In fact, we have people at Calvary who can help you with that if you're interested. So what does Calvary Assembly do with the money that comes in? That's a good question. So let me give you a few examples. We give away tens of thousands of dollars every year to make sure that the barriers of geography, ethnicity, education, and scarcity do not keep people from learning about the grace of God. That wherever you live, no matter what country, no matter what language, no matter what you have access to or don't have access to, every single person has a human right to experience the grace of God for themselves. And they can't afford, they don't even know how to have someone come. So what we do is we're willing to help support those who are willing to go. Our church uh, family provides ministry to those who are hurting and those who are suffering. There are people who walk through very difficult things and there are people who are available to them to serve. We want to help with that. There are, there are uh, every single student who wants to participate in Flower City Work Camp, which is a huge missions project every year in, in Rochester that students across our region participate in. If they can't afford to go, we make sure they still get to go. Counseling is provided at little or no cost to people who are struggling financially so that they can have a person who they feel is supportive of them. Run to the end, which you know helps rescue children and keep them out of human trafficking situations in Bangladesh. Our church has been able to write the check to keep that enterprise going year after year after year, and children are free and growing healthy because of it. We provided gifts to under-resourced children in two schools. They didn't have enough, and so our church family stepped up and helped out. We provided financial assistance for people who are they're in life groups, and they, they can't go to a life group because they've got children and they can't afford a, a, a sitter for their, their kids. I don't know if you're aware of this. Maybe you're not. But our church will actually pay for the, the sitter for your children so that you can be part of a community and, and part of a life group if you can't afford it because we think that that's important. We provided support to first responders and to healthcare professionals. We provide premarital counseling uh, to, to couples who want to get married. Why do we do that? Because we think that's important. We provide benevolence to help assist people who are in emergencies so that the gas and electric doesn't have to be turned off, or if it is off, it can be turned back on. We've helped people, we've helped connect people through social media and online services. Might be surprised you, but they, they actually don't give us this stuff for free just because we're 
our church. So we're, we use some of our resources to do that. We've created environments where children are not only happy to come, they're actually excited to come, and, and, and they actually invite their friends to church. It's quite a remarkable thing. During nat national disasters or natural disasters, We've contributed our two favorite organizations, their Convoy of Hope and World Relief. And the reason we like doing, uh, working with them so much is because of how much of the resource actually gets to the people on the ground, but also because that they work through local churches. Because if you just send people in to help with a problem, eventually those people have to go home. But if you work through a local church, the local church is always there. And the, the local church will continue to serve those people well. Uh, we help to plant other churches. We, we help struggling churches. There, there have been churches who, who were not able to get through the season they were in, and out of, the, out of your generosity, resources were sent to them so that they could continue to serve their community well. We contribute to organizations that are not part of our denominational fellowship because we don't think that God only works through our denominational fellowship. And we cover the salary of ministry team so they can continue to give themselves fully to the work of the Lord. They, they could have other jobs, but isn't it great that they can give their entire week to serving God's people and to serving our community instead of just part of their week? Our world cannot be changed by what we hoard, by what we hide, and by what we hold, and we won't be changed by those things either. If our hands stay closed, so will our heart, and our world will not be changed. If we want our hearts to change, this is what people do, right? This is how we think. Okay, as soon as I feel better in my heart, then I'll let go of something. It's actually not how it works. If you want to feel something different in your heart, start opening your hand first. It's amazing what God does with that. People will believe God is generous when they see that his followers are generous. That's how it works. I'm going to have the worship team to come out. The truth is, is we would love to plant more churches and we would love to support more missions and we would love to make a difference in the life of more under-resourced people. Um, we're looking at an opportunity right now. There are people who supported America in Afghanistan and it's no longer safe for them to live there. And a lot of them are coming to the United States. Some of them are coming to Rochester. We already have 10 to 11 people who've said they want to be a good neighbor to them when they get here. They, they've said, you know what? When they show up, we want them to feel welcome. I'm, I'm getting requests right now to help underwrite the cost because they have to have an apartment or a home that they can live in and they have to have furnishings because they, they're bringing nothing with them. And we're looking for ways that we can help them. Uh, there are people who, who want to go into ministry and they can't afford the educational process. Wouldn't it be great if we could help subsidize some of their costs so that when they went into ministry, they could help others? Here's what I want you to hear. The more you give, the more we give. The more you give, the more we give. God likes to share with people who like to share. God trusts generous people with more. This is what it says in Proverbs, 11th chapter. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. In fact, this is what I'd like us to do. I'd like us all to read these verses out loud and together. Would you with me? One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. God uses our generosity to change us and others. Now I know when I talk about things like this, there are people that oh, uh, the pastor must be looking for a raise. I'm not. In fact, 
I actually don't counsel other pastors to do this, but I've never asked for a raise here. I don't do what I do for money. I do what I do because God radically transformed my heart. And he called me to make a difference in our world. And I want to do that. I'm not looking for more money. I'm not looking for nicer things around here. I'm looking for a way to reach more and more with the goodness and the grace of God. Is there anybody in the house that experienced something of the goodness and the grace of God for yourselves? Anybody? Anybody? Don't you want that for anybody else? Don't you want that for anybody else? And the way that happens is through generosity. When we open our hands and our hearts, the world changes. Heavenly Father, I ask that you help our hearts to be opened by your grace, not by guilt, not by pressure, not by manipulation, but simply by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand to our feet.